Non-metastatic prostate cancer, non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer has been a problem for physicians because uh, we've wanted to intervene with the newer therapies that we have, but we haven't in some cases had the regulatory approval to do so, and in payers have in some cases said uh, it's not appropriate to treat that. Uh, but once we have data that shows that we can improve metastasis-free survival uh, in the non-metastatic patients, uh, and once we uh, can show that there's a clinical benefit associated with treating it in that clinical state, uh, I think we will all be very gratified that we have an option to give to our patients. One of the things that may affect M0 CRPC is better imaging. And the trials that we talked about were all done with classic traditional imaging, meaning if a patient did not have metastasis seen on a bone scan, if the patient didn't have metastasis seen on a CAT scan, they were deemed to be non-metastatic. At the same time these new drugs are com potentially coming online for M0, M0 CRPC, we have novel PET scans that are now coming online that supposedly do a better job of picking up early metastasis. So one of the things that we have to watch out for is will the M0 category of patients shrink as these more effective imaging agents come online and how will that affect the use of enzalutamide and apalutamide and potentially darolutamide in the future. Beyond these oral antiandrogens, the other exciting thing is molecular signatures and recognizing that prostate cancer, advanced prostate cancer, is a, probably a multitude of diseases that is eventually going to be defined by its molecular genetics. As an example, a couple of really hot papers have come out in the last couple of years. One showing that about 12% of men presenting with metastatic prostate cancer actually had uh, hereditary mutations in key driver genes. In plain English, up to, gosh, almost one out of seven patients who presented our doorstep with metastatic prostate cancer, their prostate cancer may be caused by a hereditary mutation and some of those genes include the BRCA genes that are widely known and used in breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And even to follow up on that further, in some patients they have these BRCA mutations and interestingly the PARP inhibitors which are now used in ovarian and breast cancer are also effective in prostate cancer. So that's the first you know, proof of principle that molecular genetics in prostate cancer can actually make a difference in therapeutics. If it wasn't for those molecular discoveries, I mean, who would have ever even imagined that a drug used in breast cancer and ovarian cancer to treat a BRCA-positive woman would have any bearing on prostate cancer? And so it's the first example of really exciting times, and I would imagine that uh, 10, 15, 20 years from now, yes, we'll probably still be using hormonal therapy and androgen deprivation therapy as kind of our backbone therapy for advanced prostate cancer, but at that point, we'll probably be layering in many more novel uh, pharmacologic agents based on the molecular signature of that cancer. There are other drugs in development for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. One of the hot areas is PARP inhibitors. So for those prostate cancer patients who have metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer and the tumor expresses DNA repair defects, they may be getting PARP inhibitors, which are drugs already approved in the ovarian cancer setting. Um, so if a cancer cell is missing uh, BRCA, BRCA1 or 2, uh, or ATM, it can't repair double-strand breaks very efficiently. And then you throw in a PARP inhibitor, which blocks another pathway of repairing double-strand DNA breaks, and the cancer cell dies. So that's an area that's being actively explored at this point. And it's possible that it, too, will move up earlier in the disease. Um, I, myself, am doing studies of checkpoint inhibition with pembrolizumab, which is a PD-1 inhibitor. Um, you know, we're learning more about the genetic instability of these tumors. So not all cancer, not all prostate cancer patients have you know, multi-mutated tumor, 
But for those who do, um, PD-1 inhibition might be effective. And there are also other studies of um, alpha particles. Um, so radium-223 is currently approved for people with symptomatic skeletal tumors, um, but it only goes to the bone. And there are many agents in development, like actinium, lucium, that can attack tumors outside of the bone. So we'll see more movement, I think, in intravenous radiopharmaceuticals. I am most looking forward to curing some of my patients. I think that's on the horizon, either with new treatments or combinations of current treatments, better understanding the patient's biology, and setting the bar even higher for our clinical trials, not just helping people live three months longer, but actually wiping out this disease. That's what I'm most hopeful for.